we have a very important uh, hour ahead of us here with one of our illustrious alumni from Royce Moore, Naomi Rubenstein, class of 2014. And she is joining us all the way from Liverpool, England. So we're super excited. Yes, thanks for joining us, Naomi. Um, so Naomi had an amazing um, experience, um, I think both here at Royce Moore and since she's left Royce Moore. And we were so excited about um, what she has been doing that we wanted to share that with our community today. So Naomi, welcome. We're so glad to have you join us today. Thank you, thank you. So um, share with us a little bit about your, let's, before we get into what you're doing now, which is so amazing and interesting, can you share with us uh, what your Royce Moore experience was like? So I started at Royce Moore in seventh grade when it was a change from like a really bad middle school to what I think is the most amazing experience I had for middle school ever. So it was a really good change and it was a really welcoming community and I found it really different and really nice and small and yeah. And you, were there particular things about your experience here that stood out to you? It was, even in middle school, we had a lot of independence, which I had not expected from any school before. It was really nice to be treated as like an actual person, not some little kid as a middle schooler, which was really important to help us kind of, kind of feel of a sense of pride in what we were doing. And then from middle school, I stayed on high school, which was really great. Um, so the one thing I thought was really nice about my year was we were a very small class. I think we were around 18. I might be misnumbering that, but I think we were about 18 of us in my graduating year, which was really nice because we got to know everybody. Yeah. And yeah, I think one of the most amazing things about the high school experience was JST. So January short term. And you did January short term every, every year yeah. in high school. Were there particular uh, experiences during JST that stood out to you? Yes. Um, when I think it was 11th grade, I did the internship with the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. And I did archiving for archaeological material. And during then, I got a chance to meet with their museum conservator and got like a whole day being shown what conservation is and which is like the restoration of historic objects and she gave us like a walkthrough of how things work there and that actually led me into what I ended up going into for my undergrad so that was a really important JST. I, I guess so um, you had this amazing experience and you decided um, you know you went to England for for school and you've stayed there, which is a really interesting choice and path. Um, and you've been focusing on archeology span ever since is what I understand. So um, can you share with us um, what inspired you to go to England for your studies? Because starting about 11th grade, once I had made up my mind that this is what I want to do, this is, seeing like conservation and working with historic objects. I started looking at what kind of programs I could do in the US, but all of them were four year degrees that you had the, the general education year. And I decided that wasn't really what I wanted to do because during my time at Royce Moore, we were able to kind of fit the curriculum to us, which was really nice. And I kind of wanted to find a university that I could do that for. So I started looking elsewhere and found that England, they expect you to choose what you want earlier. So you're able to just go in and get a very hands-on experience. So it just felt really like a next step from Royce Moore. It made a lot of sense. Mm. And were there, were there particular things that you learned while you were a student at Royce Moore that really helped you uh, as you went into college? Yes. If anyone listening has taken any of Mr. Hunt's classes, you will understand this how to write an outline. 
it seems like a really easy thing, but when you start doing like dissertations and big reports of like 20,000 words or more, being able to actually outline your thoughts and carry through your outline is one of the most important things you will ever, ever learn. So thank Mr. Hunt, people, it's really important. I'm sure he will appreciate hearing, hearing that because he worked really hard to support you and other students to write well, you know, because writing is such a, a critical skill in life, no matter what you pursue. And also like Royce Moore taught us to try to get things in early. We used to get like 10, 10 points extra credit if we turned things in early. And that kind of kicked the habit for me to always get things done before deadlines. Oh, I like that. Very helpful in case there was a problem. I always had something to fall back onto. So that's another hint. Anybody is listening just to, to good advice to keep that habit up, turn things in early if you can. And that way you have time to fix things. Yeah, really the opposite of procrastination, which we all um, can fall victim to the procrastination piece and um, yeah you're right it gives you a lot of time to to make things better not that you want to be a complete perfectionist because sometimes that can stall you completely yeah. but um, to but that idea of knowing that if you do miss a deadline your first deadline is the early one and you still do have time and it gives you kind of a sense of freedom that you're not going to be sitting doing nothing and then all of a sudden it's due tomorrow and you haven't started. Yeah, that's not a good feeling. <laughs> um, so I'm really interested in, you know, your under, undergraduate degree um, was at the University of Lincoln, is that right? Yeah, yeah University mm -hmm. of Lincoln in conservation and restoration of historic objects. And I ended up specializing in archaeological material and metal objects. So how, how did that with, happen? What uh, what inspired that choice? I kind of just fell in love with arche the archaeology side of things and the fact that this is like a direct link to our past, and it just makes made me really happy. So, what are some of the kinds of things that you've had an opportunity to examine and learn about? Uh, so I've had, to working with archaeological material, I've had like a very wide range of things. I worked on waterlogged shoes, which was really exciting and different. I worked with waterlogged wood that has been carbon dated to before 20, 24,000 years old. And it has stone tool marks. So it has evidence of early human activity on something wow. that, that old. I've also have like worked with more recent stuff. I've done some metal objects that came out of a trench from World War One, and I had the bullet. It was a water canteen and a mess kit with a bullet hole through both, which was very wow. <laughs> yeah, it was really amazing to be able to work with real museum objects and a wide variety of things. Is there a particular museum that um, you're connected to there at uh, the university? Um, after I graduated my undergrad, I did a internship for a year at um, Derby Museum in Derby, England. So I spent the year working as an object conservator for ethnographic material. So that's basically objects from all over the world, which was a really amazing experience. So you're able to experience different cultures through objects, which was a really big like eye opener for me. And is is there a period of history that you've become most drawn to with your archaeological research? Um, I would say the Romans, so end of the Roman Empire. Mm. Well, I mean, you're certainly in a place that is steeped in Roman history, so that's a benefit being living where you are. Yeah, really good. I'm just looking at the chat. Oh, thank you, Vicki. <laughs> thing like, I really liked about conservation was it's about like, it's all the behind the scene work for museums. And I think that JST at the Oriental Institute opened that, like my eyes to that whole entire field. So I had not 
known that even existed before. So yeah, it was really exciting and really amazing eye opener. And were you drawn to the university where you are um, because of certain um, professors that are there? Um, for undergrads, I was drawn to the program because it was described as a very hands-on learning approach where from the first year you're given a real museum object and are taught to work like as you have a real object. So it's not, it's theory being applied directly to material. So that was what draw, drew me to Lincoln. And then for Liverpool where I'm doing my PhD, my master's and I did my, or I did my master's and now my PhD, it was one of the staff members. I had written an abstract and sent it to a, lots of different people. And I found one who was very interested. And are you at the University of Liverpool now or? Okay, okay. All right, so um, before we went live on uh, Facebook, I was talking with uh, Naomi. I have a um, stepson who lives near there and um, I've had the opportunity to visit Liverpool. So for anybody who's not ever had the chance to visit Liverpool, I highly recommend it. It's an amazing, amazingly interesting place. If you grow up, at least in my generation, if you grow up in the United States, we tend to associate Liverpool with the Beatles. Um, but for people who grew up in the UK or in England, they tend to associate Liverpool with football or soccer. Uh, but there's a lot, lot more there, um, a lot of history and a lot of culture and obviously a great university. Um, so you are nine months in to your PhD, is that right? Okay. Can you share with us like what that um, experience is like for you um, working on your PhD there? What, um, what are you working on and um, what, what do you hope to um, focus on for your dissertation? All right, so what I've been working on up until the whole COVID situation, I was looking at different coin hoards and using this chemical analysis called x-ray fluorescence, which shoots x-rays at an object and then it, because each, uh, each element has different like fluorescence like, of light and energy you get like different peaks so you can identify which chemicals are present based on what bounces back. So I'm using that to identify coins and try to figure out which ones are real and which ones are period copies. So it's a very niche thing for fourth century Roman coin hoard. <laughs> yes, it's very niche. It's a very niche. I'm looking at an 11 year period. Wow. Very focused. Yeah. And, um, when you finish your PhD, what do you hope to, to do with that? Uh, I would like to go into teaching. That would be the ideal. So that would be, that's my goal, get a teaching job after. Okay. And any particular part of the world you would hope to do that? Would you hope to come back to the United States or stay in the UK? Ideally, I, I do like it here, and I think I might end up staying in this country if I can. Like, if jobs are here, I'll stay. If jobs are back in the States, I will go to where the jobs are. But I really do like the UK. And do you have any sense of what would be different um, teaching in the UK versus in the United States for a profession? I think for the way archaeology in general is taught is a bit different. So the way the UK does recording is different to how other countries in Europe do it, so and different to how the US records. So it would be a bit of a learning curve to the way things are recorded in the US. Can you say more about that? Um, the US has a bit of a, it's every state for their own kind of attitude. So there's not really a set guideline to different digs in the states will record things differently. I work, I did a six week internship in my undergrad with National Park Service in the US and learned that their recording system is all over the place. It's not consistent in different parks, despite being one park service. Mm -hmm. So it is dependent on how each dig in the US records things and they're on their own system. Where the UK, they have a kind of standard, this is how things are done 
and people might deviate from it, but they're all meant to be following a block standard. So okay. it's a bit it's a learning curve of how recording is done. Right. And have there been particular um, skills that you have gained in your in your research uh, in archaeology during the time that you've been studying there in the UK that uh, you are particularly excited about and want to share? Um, feel like the ability to identify like different types of ceramic has been actually really kind of fun. Being able to start looking at bits of like pottery and go, this is cooking pot, this is not. It's been a really, just really fun. It's like every time I go walking with a friend, we usually will go, since we live in the Victorian housing state area, there's always just bits of ceramics around. And it's, every time I walk with my friend, I just point things out and go, this is what this is. So it's you oh, start that's... picking up little things and how to identify random pipe stems and things like that. So you're, you're mentioning ceramics and pottery. Um, I see on um, our chat, there's a note from Mrs. Hecht yes. who is saying hello to you. <laughs> so maybe you took pottery from Mrs. Hecht, I don't know. I no. did sculpture with Mrs. Hecht, which was a really like, very good hands-on approach. Because we ended up, especially with undergrad, we had the first year we had to do ceramics, we had to do like sculpting missing parts of pieces. And that was really nice ha ha having sculpture, being able to actually like learn how to carve stone and learning how to do, because we did stope stone sculptures. So learning how to actually do the, all the carving and things that were actually very useful later on. So, yeah. That's great. Um, we have a question from Vicki Pickett who wants to know what is the most surprising thing you've learned when working with a historical object? I think it's gonna be a bit of a weird one. It's that people in the past had smaller feet. <laughs> what? <laughs> I told you, my, for my final project in third year in undergrad, I was given a waterlogged leather shoe that was identified, which I had thought at first was a child's shoe because it was very small. Um, after doing research, I learned that was the average adult male foot size. So a, U, a U.S. size three used to be considered the average adult male foot size in the 12th century. And like from that shoe, you were able to learn how the person walked based on the wear pattern of the sole. And the particular shoe I was working on, it was very clear that this person had an issue with their toe because it was severe like wear just around the toe, no, nowhere else on the actual part of the shoe. So you're able to learn about how, what this person did have, like they took problems. They had a very weird walk. So they, they wore the outside of the shoe, the foot wore the sole down, the inside was fine. So you learn a lot of random things about shoes. That is pretty, pretty random. Uh, is there a, um, a correlation then to the height? Uh, um, expected as well or it's it just is, to an extent and a lot of it has to do with malnutrition mm. because people were especially were eating lots of grain they were not having a very very diet they if they were having meat it would have been fish and maybe a few eggs but that would have been their diet would have been 90 percent grains and maybe a fish once a week if they were lucky so they weren't getting much protein. They were not getting much nutrients. So you had people, they were smaller and lower life expectancy, and hence also smaller feet. That is that is really interesting. It's, yeah. you know, through these objects that you can kind of peer into the past and the life. a lot about people, which I think is really important it's really important to start studying the past just because you, if you just go, oh, well, history books say this. Well, history is written by people that, who want to be remembered in a certain way. They're not always accurate. For sure, for sure. And um, through, through objects, yeah, you, you can, can learning. You know, you, 
you have you science have a definitive proof of what has happened based on what's left behind because archaeology in essence is the preservation of garbage it's what people have left behind is what you're finding the nice things that people took with them don't get left behind on sites when the building is left like for abandoned whatever was left behind is what essentially was not worth taking in the move mm. and you learn a lot about daily lives of people that way so it makes me think about what are people going to be learning about our daily lives in a few <laughs> years time from you know study of our objects the um we were talking about mrs hecht being on um this call a couple of years ago she partnered up with uh, Mr. Harine, who's an upper school history teacher, and um, they were studying cave paintings in history and what that means from a communication standpoint. And so um, they, the high school students, teamed up with the middle school students to do cave paintings, but modern paintings with um, Mrs. Hecht. And so part of the um, guidance was thinking about things that are our ordinary objects that um, are part of our lives that should be in those paintings. So of course, cell phones um, showed up in those paintings, but it was a really interesting um, project, hands-on project for the students to um, connect the past to the present for them using art and, and history. That is a good project. Yeah. So if, if we had students, if we have students at Royce Moore today that are thinking about um, archaeology as a course of study for college, would you have any particular advice for them? Um, I'd say definitely look at, definitely consider it. Don't think, oh, it's a weird degree. No one's going to hire me. There are plenty of jobs out there for archaeology. And they're in the strangest places. The National Park Service hires a, a very large amount of archaeologists in the US. And they do digs all over the country. So there's always jobs out there. And what are they doing with the National Park Service in terms of archaeological digs? So a lot of the actual parks, they'll have the rangers will go out on trails and their people will find stuff. And they'll actually carry out excavations because a lot of them are on historic sites. You have a lot of them are looking at early, like settlers looking at early 18th century stuff. So there are digs going on a lot in the US. Sometimes they're more modern. So you have some excavations of like slave quarters and plantations that they're trying to learn about the people who live there because that was never recorded on paper. So they don't know how many people may have actually been working at these sites. They don't know. They don't really know anything about the people where they came from because that was never really recorded. So they're through archaeology, they're trying to find what belongings were left behind, who were these people. So people can trace their heritage back to this is who where we came from, this is where things were. Okay. So the Park Service does a lot of archaeological digs. Okay, okay. And then what other kind of advice would you give students if they were wanting to explore this uh, field? Try to find dig if you're able to, to see if you can find dig to volunteer on. I've been, personally, I did a dig in the UK during my senior year of high school, which was a really good experience. And how, there are dig How did that happen? How were you able to make that happen? Kind of stumbled upon it. I was. My mother and I were kind of in Wales for a completely different re different reason, and we just kind of saw an like a thing in the paper saying just come and dig for a day. Oh and wow! Then that day became a week, and then the next year I came back for two and a half weeks, and then the year after that, every year after that, it's been a full month. Wow! I ended up working for the site. That's fantastic. In in um, what what part of Wales were you doing uh, this? So it's on the border with England and Wales in an area called Monmouth. Okay. And it's a 13th century site, well, 12th to 13th century, and it at its peak was the biggest settlement in medieval Wales. And by biggest, I mean it had 210 recorded house plots. 
Mm. So this beats Carter by 20 house plots. Okay. So this is massive city in yeah. Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages. And if students wanted to try to find a dig to work on, like where, where would they start? Um, so there's a lot of digs that will ab advertise on Facebook. There are a lot of Facebook archaeology groups. If people post questions, there are digs out there. The US, there's a lot of digs going on and California has digs usually. Um, there's a archaeological and paleontolo paleontology dig. I think it is Utah or maybe it's California. I'm trying to remember. It's a housing development site that they started digging foundation only to find mammoths. Oh and my goodness. That dig has been going on for I think 10 years and they're still finding things and they take volunteers. And can you share like what that would look like if you were to volunteer on a dig? Um, so usually you would be camping on the site and you would be kind of just going through layers of the earth and you're trying to uncover things and record what you find. So the purpose is you're recording what's been left behind. So if it's an excavation of a house, actually, I'm going to go grab something that will show you. Yeah. All right, so I think all of us want to go volunteer on a dig now. That's going to be on my bucket list for sure. It's a very brief drawing, but it works. Explain okay. an average site. Yeah. So this isn't a, a thought of the site that worked on Wales. And I've What I've done here is I've tried to do building phases so you can learn a lot about the objects themselves. But you can also learn a lot about the sites through the buildings that are left behind. So being able to date different like, stages in the building. So when your house gets renovated, if you look carefully, you might see the brick color is different than the original brick in the house. You might notice that it was built in a 70s style and now you've put like very modern front ed edition with glass. So the same kind of things happen with archaeolog in archaeological periods. You have style changes. So when you're on excavation, you're always on the lookout for things that are different when things start changing. So for that one, I started the red, and this picture is the original things that we think are part of the medieval house. Okay. And then same picture in blue is everything that was added on in post medieval times. So they took this part of the wall and built themselves a chimney stack fireplace at one point because that became all the rage in post medieval England. Uh-huh. Wow. So the house has updated for modern times. And and you worked on this dig over how many years was it? Um eight years on site. Wow. And who was funding this um dig? This one is funded mainly by um, volunteers who come to do work on the dig. And then it's owned by one, one man bought the field with the purpose of just digging it. And really? Just a personal passion that this person yeah. had? He was an archaeology archeolog graduate who had done excavation on the field across from it. And they had found a medieval house there but he asked if he can continue the excavation and the landowner said no, because he was going to do, build his house on top of it. Mm -hmm. So instead he decided to buy the field across and he started that in 2005 and it's still continuing on. Wow. And we take students starting at like age 14. So, and younger if they have parents with them. Okay. And if you're volunteering on a dig like this, you said you can go onto Facebook and I mean, how would you even start to try to um, so find opportunities? There are a lot of different Facebook groups. So like there's, for the UK, there's the British Archaeological Resource Group. So if people join that Facebook group, they can post saying, does anyone know any digs for beginners? And people will just comment and give them tons of information. 
It's a very helpful group to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen it, my dad says, the mammoths were South Dakota. So I was way off. It, has there been someone who has been a particular mentor to you along the way, Naomi? Um, I want to say. It, as you've, well, it could be at Royce Moore or, you know, as you've pursued the field of archaeology. At Royce Moore, I would say Miss Wallace, then became Miss George, but I think she's no longer teaching at Royce Moore. But okay. She was a French teacher, but also a homeroom, our homeroom teacher all throughout high school, which was really great. Yeah, she actually uh, still stays in touch with us. And um, she was working at Royce Moore last summer with our summer uh, programs. So we get to see her um, off and on, which is lovely. Yeah, I was in her French class of two, first year. Of oh, two. Fourth grade French. It was me and Phoebe, just us, just two oh, of us. Okay, that's personal attention, right? It was a good class, it was really fun. Mm -hmm. And what about with um, your interest in archaeology? Has there been somebody who's been a mentor to you? Um, not so much a mentor as more of like I built a support network of other people from like other from working on the digs and other people who have come to help run the dig every year. We kind of built a support network. So if we have questions on things, we usually will just message each other going anyone have any idea what this could be anyone things so like i've managed to somehow find myself in the niche of dating 12th and 13th century horse equipment because we get a lot of that on our site so i've become somewhat good at it so now people have been sending me pictures of like stirrups and like spurs from boots going help when you say on your site are you talking about the site in wales, the site wales yeah in Wales. Wow, so it must have been um, a significant location for um, horses during medieval times. Yeah, because we know it was a metalworking site later periods. And then two years ago, we had excavated the black, a blacksmith on the field. So we oh, had okay. lots of metal finds coming up. So was it. And when that, when that happens, do you you know, when you've discovered something on a dig like that, then do you go and try to find similar items yeah. at a museum somewhere to try yeah. to place it or? We'll look at other excavation reports, museums, and see who has objects that are similar, where have they come from, what dates have they given it, and what dates of the sites were these found at? So you can start making links saying, this looks like very similar to something found in Oxford. This looks very similar. And you get the same with pottery. So you can start saying, this is a region-specific type of ceramic, but it's being found in other regions. And you can start building trade networks based on where things are being found, which is a really interesting way of looking at how far people were traveling and where, and where they were actually traveling to. That is interesting. What has been in, in your work so far um, one of the most surprising things that you've learned? I would say it might be actually a PhD is the fact that there were people copying Roman coins for non-fraudulent reasons, which- say, say more about that. I'm curious. So that. It's a very weird kind of thing in Britain in the fourth century. There's this huge like epidemic of fake coins being made, but they're fake coins of pocket change. So the coins with the lowest value and no precious metal in the coin. So they don't make any sense to make forgeries of coins that are worth less than five cents. When there are bigger coins, they could be copying out there. But Britain seems to have lots of them and nobody really knows why or who's making them. Huh learning that they were not like for forgery was a bit of a shock for me because I at first assumed well clearly there must be just forgery but they seem to be accepted and used across the whole country so wow so they're fake coins 
made at the time, commonly accepted and used at the time, sort of a, a dual currency, if you will? There's a thought that they might be being made by the military as an exchange rate. The military would have been paid in the higher coin, which they couldn't spend in market because nobody would. It's like if you tried going to a, a shop and giving a hundred dollar bill for something that cost one dollar fifty, no one's going to give you change for that. So, so it's sort of like their version of Bitcoin, this alternative currency, maybe. I think because people can't easily identify the coins. They don't really know if military sites actually have more copies than non-military sites. So that's what I'm doing for the PhD, trying to find a way that we could identify them reliably from different sites without having to rely on how bad or how good the coin looks. Because copies have a different composition than the real ones. And how did you how did you stumble upon this very specific interest? It, in our, in my third year in undergrad, we had for one of the modules, like we had a science report that we had to write when we were each working on different archeological objects. And I was working on the Roman coin. So my lecturer told me, oh, you can look at the coin, try finding its composition and seeing if you can match it to literature. And I tried and it, it did not match to anything. And that's kind of started me going, well, it's not matching the real coins. What is it? And it ended up actually being a copy. And that ended up me going down the rabbit hole of finding very angry people in the 80s go, making complaints saying more work needs to be done. And then one person trying, but at the time the equipment wasn't really up to standard. Mm. Then nothing being done since 1981 even though multiple people since have said more work needs to be done. And they're still calling the work from the eighties as recent work in 2017. So at that point I decided this is not recent. I'm going to fix this. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. And, you know, obviously the technology has changed dramatically since the eighties. So what technology do you have access to now? that you're using in this work that you didn't so I'm have. using X-ray fluorescence in the portable machines. So you're able to like, take it to museums and actually use it and get composition as you're there. Where in the past, the machine used to be the size of an actual room and it was very slow and you were only able to read about one millimeter size on a coin. And that's not a very good representation of the composition for the whole coin. So having a more rapid method that works faster, more reliable, and reads larger area is a huge advantage. So technology has helped a lot. Yeah, and the skill of using these tools, did that happen um, at school or in your volunteer work? At school, I was able, you learn through training in undergrad. Okay. Through kind of, in science module, we were all taught how to use different equipment, which is a very hands-on course. Okay. And are those kinds of opportunities, that kind of training common in the United States if you had pursued your degree in the United States? Or is this something that's more... Probably not in undergrad. I know that a lot of the programs in the U.S. are very theory-based for at least conservation. And archaeology, usually the U.S. will tie it into anthropology. So it is a bit harder to find a pure archaeology degree in the U.S. Whereas abroad, it's a lot more easy. It's a lot easier to just find pure archaeology. So I think that's one of the big differences. Yeah, it's so important to be able to find the right niche for yourself. And you know, I think sometimes, I mean, and it's one of the things that I really value about Royce Moore is that individual approach with the college counseling and advising and, you know, it's not about going to a specific college because that college has a name. It's about, you know, what are your needs and your path. And so, you know, you clearly have followed that um, for yourself. Yeah. And I definitely would encourage others to consider it, even though it seems like it must be much harder to go abroad. It actually is cheaper in a lot of cases, which sounds crazy, but it is. And it's also a very good opportunity if you know what you want to do 
you're able to pursue a degree and get an entire undergraduate degree in three years instead of having to do a full general education year. And the same goes with masters. If you have something you really want to do, you can do a 12 month masters. So entire, basically two year masters done in the course of one calendar year. Mm. Do you know why that is? Why it's so different? I, I think it's the three years for undergrad is because they have, when we're, what they're equivalent to high school, they end up choosing what they kind of want to specialize in. So they take four classes over the course of two years and they really chose a specialty. So they kind of, are, that is their general education year instead of us in high school having multiple subjects. Mm -hmm. And then the masters, I think it's just the preference of getting people want to be able to go get a degree and then go into the workplace and not have to put two years out of their life doing so. Because mm -hmm. in the UK, it's a lot more common to have mature students starting undergrad. So people starting past the age of 20, 20 like usually mature would be 23 and up as a first year student. Mm -hmm. At that point, if you start at 23, you're gonna now finish at 26. If you do a two year masters, it takes up more of your life than just getting 12 month calendar year. Mm -hmm. And is there funding in the UK for graduate work like there often is in the United States? There is, yes. So there are like universities will offer scholarships to international students. There are, they're not as, there are more competitive because you are playing against other people, but they are there. And I think some schools will still actually accept US financial aid. What does that look like? Um, so it'd be the kind of same like getting government loans for university can still be used in the university abroad. I see. So if you had, say, a Pell Grant or something like that in the United States, you could potentially use it overseas. Is that what you're indicating? I think it's more like the government loans for if you're going to get a gen general government loan for education, you can I use see. that. I see. Great. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say about what you're studying? Because I'm going to um, segue to culture questions. No, culture. Sorry. Okay. Because, you know, you're living this really interesting experience in the UK. And um, for those of us who are Anglophiles, we, I'm sure, are um, missing the kinds of things that you can get in um, Europe. So what are your favorite uh, things that you either like to do or you like to eat um, or experience uh, in Liverpool or in the UK? Um, the amazing tea culture of no matter where you go, people just make tea. It's, it's always there. And it's, it's amazing. Did you drink tea before you went to England? I did, but you not did? to the extreme extent of, I think, on average now, like three cups of tea a day. <laughs> And what about the scones? Do you have scones too? Yes, they are. They are most amazing. That's my favorite. They scones are. With climate and cream. cream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are the best. Deadly. Really deadly. So <laughs> it's really hard to have tea without a biscuit or yes. a biscuit. It's a cookie. Okay. Yeah, yeah biscuit. Yeah. Okay. The namings of things are my sister and brother would like would come back. For holidays and undergrad, they would just make fun of me for saying, like, calling it a bin instead of trash. They would just be like, it's garbage can, it's not a bin. <laughs> and things like that. When you've lived there long enough, I'm sure you're picking up a lot of the lingo and forgetting, like, what's English and what's yeah, American. Spelling as well. It's been a bit confusing at first. Mm -hmm. It's spelled a bit differently. Mm -hmm. With the U. O U or yeah, the color. R, yeah. L O U R. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. What about your favorite place to go? Um, it's a bit of a weird. I I really like Derby, mainly because of when I was working there, I met amazing people and built like a family almost. Just the people I go to, I've been able to see my friend's daughter grow up for the last three years, which 
amazing. So I've become like an older sister to my friend's daughter, which has been really great. So I feel like my favorite place there is Darby and going walking in the Peak District. And help me um, geographically, where is Darby located? Okay, so Liverpool is here. Yeah. Darby is down in the cross, so it's the middle of the country. Okay. So it's in the Midlands. Okay, in the Midlands. Great. Uh, and favorite thing to do when you're not studying or working? Museums. Museums. Yes. Okay, is there a must-see museum if someone was visiting? I want to say British Museum, the National Museum of Wales. Mm -hmm. And Which where's the, the British Museum's in London, correct? In, in, yeah, National Museum of Wales in Cardiff. In Cardiff, okay. Okay. And do you like to do any um, hiking or traveling around the country? When I have time, yes. Yeah, I've been up to Hadrian's Wall a few times, which is amazing up there. And then to like some Roman sites around the wall, which has been really great. Well, I popped back on here um, to see if there are questions in the chat and to see if there are questions here on Facebook. So uh, if anyone has questions they'd like to ask Naomi, we have about 13 minutes left um, and we want to make those minutes count. So um, I had a question about the um, med medieval dig you were doing in Wales and I'm, I've been obsessed since I was a little girl with King Arthur and I wondered what, um, what you think about that myth um, having dug around there. <laughs> there's a lot of, in, at least in Wales, there's a lot of thought that he was a Welsh person who was work, fighting for the Romans. There's a lot of that as the, the idea. It's less popular outside of Wales, but if you're in Wales, they will tell you that King Arthur is Welsh and is 100% Welsh. They will not let you argue that. <laughs> but I think there probably is some truth to a myth with people's name, with names and things. If he actually pull the sword out of the lake from a lady, who knows, but like, I mean, I totally believe that. I mean, myths <laughs> are usually based off some truth, so you never know. That's awesome. Um, I have a little, a little surprise for you. Let's see, how am I going to do this? I am going to... Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Bring some people up here to say hello. Do you have a camera? Oh, unmute, Ruth. I gotta unmute. There you go. Actually, you're on mute now. You've just put yourself on mute. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You've done so much. It's so cool that you're doing this, all this archaeology in, in the UK. How cool is that? It's been fun. It's been really awesome. How do you think, um, I don't know, having taken sculpture helped your archaeology? It's helped with the conservation a lot, being able to actually re- like sculpt missing parts and things, which has been very useful because I've been able to do some nice freelance work for people on different ceramics and little sculptures. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Oh. Look, look who else we've got for you. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi there, no. No. I want to say, Come here. and we are so proud of Naomi and I honestly want to thank Royce Moore. They really let Naomi be Naomi and they gave her the academic tools to succeed and they just let her really explore what she wanted and we love Royce Moore. So thank you guys. It's been a fantastic education. And um, here's here's Naomi's grandpa. So he wants to say hello. Hi there, Naomi. And I just want to say that You've always danced to your own drummer, and Royce Moore encouraged oh, that. 
Hi. You guys are so hot. <laughs> oh. Oh, so I'm sorry that her family was there. I, really I wanted you to be able to see Lily. <laughs> Naomi babysat Lily when she was in ki uh, junior kindergarten at Ricemore. Hi. <laughs> she says hi. Oh, Scott and Tamar, please continue. Well, I don't think we have much more to say. Just that, uh, you know, we're very proud. Naomi's done great. And, you know, like anything, a good foundation leads to uh, good success in the future. I keep teasing Naomi and saying that next to the entrance to the British Museum will be the uh, thing that Naomi has set up. And so Naomi and the British Museum will be partners, one, two, three. And I say, and I say that to Naomi because she knows how I feel about it. She's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Open the borders for us so we can come and visit again. <laughs> well, that's so very special, Scott and Tamar. So nice to meet you. We are so proud of your daughter and um, all the great things that she is doing. Um, she set a course for herself building on the great foundation she got here at Royce Moore and is just soaring and we're so proud. And I hope that our students are inspired by what you have shared with them today. And uh, even if it's not pursuing archaeology, whatever it is. Yeah, you, what it, you what any it, questions, they, you have my email, share it. Let, I'm ha happy for people to contact me. Thank you. And you know, I think one of the things that is so wonderful is this small school you know, you had the shared experience. And so that connection as a Griffin spans generations, it spans time and space. And um, I, I so appreciate that your willingness to give back in that way, because I think that's one of the things that is wonderful about being a Griffin is that it's in some ways your passport to the world. Because you know, if you were to reach out to you know, if Naomi, you were to reach out to another alum um, somewhere else and ask for help, they would rush to, to your aid. And if um, somebody reached out to you, you would do the same because you have this really special connection over the generations. So again, we're so proud of you and it's been great to connect with you uh, across the ocean. Thanks for letting me talk. It's been really great. Well, we can't wait to see what you do next. So keep us posted, okay? I will. All right. Oh. All right, Bye, everybody. Guys. Thank you Thank so, you much. so much. It was so interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It has Thank you. Been a great. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Sarah. I was going to say um, this is not the end of our series. We are going to have Jeff Mark back for real um, on June twenty seventh. Um, so tune in then. Uh, invitations will go out and we'll, we'll post it everywhere. Um, and make sure that if you're an alum out there that wants to share, that you reach out. Uh, we want to continue to provide this format for our, our community. And um, we know that you're just as interesting as Naomi. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. And um, we'll see you soon.